She is with me, my bride of 36 years right there. And uh, she's come to keep track of me, probably, <laughs> so I can find my way home. For those of you that don't know me, I'm Jeff Tunnel. I pastored in Big Bear for 28 years, and uh, a few years back, raised up one of our young guys and put him in the, put him in the driver's seat in 2012, and, and I told him I would just sit in the back seat and heckle him. Uh, <laughs> but I'm still part of the church at Big Bear Christian Center, and uh, we worked together. He and I just returned. Uh, we spent this week in, in uh, Texcoco, Mexico, which is about 40 miles northeast of Mexico City. And we, we team taught in a pastor's conference there. And uh, for Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, after preaching in the church on Sunday, and then and, uh, the biggest highlight of going to those events, of course, is seeing all those pastors being refreshed and being strengthened. And a lot of the pastors in these Mexican villages that we work with are just gentlemen who came to know Christ in their own village and because of their own personal dedication and love for God and their pursuit of the scriptures, sometimes just on their own, the Lord sort of raises them up to be the shepherd in their own village and then the next thing they know they're pastoring a group of people and they have no training at all in the sense that we might think training is necessary. And so when we go down and and uh, do a pastor's conference from them, and we call them in out of the villages, and we feed them every day during the time. We had over 100, about 125 in the conference, and uh, they, just, they, just, they just pull everything we've got out of us. It's great. It's like draining us. And, and so we pour it into them, and then the way they pour back into us is they feed us. Oh, my goodness. These people can eat. <laughs> I mean, they're saying... Have some more, have some more. And I'm thinking, I, we, they would say, you know, estoy lleno, lleno, I'm full up to here. And I started telling them, now I'm full up to my eyeballs. I mean, I can't even see to eat anymore. And the highlight, of course, was on the Wednesday afternoon when we went to a barbecue. They said, we're going to come. The guy on Sunday afternoon pointed out and says, I want you to come to my house for a barbecue on Wednesday. And I looked to my senior pastor there, Aaron de la Borda, and I said, is that okay? And he said, it's okay. So, okay, we're coming to your house for barbecue. Well, that means he's going to kill the lamb the day before and put it in a pit barbecue and cook it overnight for hours and hours and hours underneath cactus leaves. And, and then they brought in this bowl of mixture they had made in the kitchen called escamole. Has anybody ever had escamole tacos? So we put that in a nice, ooh, nice warm tortilla, and it's this, this nice sauce. It's green, it's a little purple in there, and you put it on your taco, and you start eating, and you think, I've never, ever had a taco that tasted like this. It was smoky and kind of woodish and really tasted good. I said, I'll have another one of those. And on the third one, they said, do you know what escamole is? <laughs> no, I don't, but it sure tastes good. It's, it's called Huevos de hormiga. Does anybody speak Spanish? Huevos de hormiga. Ant eggs. Eggs of the ant. I said, and what's the sauce? Because those little purple parts that look for you and I look like a purple onion is a worm. So the sauce was ant eggs with worm sauce. Ooh. Que tremendo. Who wants to go with me? <laughs> Nobody wants to go after you tell that story. You go, no, I'll stay here. <clears throat> I had the third one. And then the surprising part. Now, we're talking about being among people who are generally poor. In fact, where we minister in a place called Cuatro Vientos, which means four winds, sits up on a hill, and literally the wind comes up all four sides of this mountain. In, within moments, the winds will change direction. So they named it Cuatro Vientos, Four Winds. And as we're driving there, a pastor says, you've heard that we have the poor in Mexico. I said, of course. He said, you're about to see the poorest of the poor. So we, we, we don't minister up on the high side of town. We minister down in the, where people live, and, and uh, they're facing the toughest issues. But at this barbecue, they're feeding this escamole to us, which I know you all want to try now. And uh, someone mentions the cost. 
because they, they just pull out all the stops to serve us. It's amazing. He said this bowl that they had made cost $100. And I'm thinking pesos, which wouldn't be much, you know, 10 bucks. They said, no, 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 dollars, American dollars, $100 for a bowl. I just ate $45 worth of tacos. And that's surprising, isn't it? Surprised me. Felt like I should have given one back. Just kidding. I'm saying that, you know, the, the poorest of the poor gather together and they take all their resources and to say thank you for pouring into their lives spiritually, they try and give back the absolute best. We try and tell them this is absolutely unnecessary. You know, we, we get it. We could just roll up tacos with salt on them or tortillas or something, and a little salsa. We're fine, just like you are. We don't need this lavishness to say thank you, but they say, but look, you are the servants of God. You've come to bring us the words of life and help us pastor our churches, and so we want to bless you back, and it's incredible, incredible. So that's where I spent my week, and I don't expect any $15 tacos for lunch from you. And you, I, I know your mind, you're going, Taco Bell, I don't even think they have anything on the menu that's $15. Turn with me to uh, 2 Thessalonians. This morning, uh, I enjoy ministering here because you're all such good students of the word. And Pastor Bill has entrusted me with a privilege. He always gives me the assignment where I'm going to preach from. So, so far, I've never shot from the wild on you. He's always hemmed me in and said, here's where you preach from. So, you're on a series, Right? on the second coming of Jesus and how many of you believe in a rapture? I just, okay. Would, you want to stand? We'll have a rapture practice. <laughs> Let's see if we can. Anybody want to practice? No. So today we're in Second Thessalonians chapter 2. Now brothers, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, and are gathering together to him, we ask you, brothers, not to become easily unsettled or alarmed by some prophecy, report, or letter supposed to have come from us, saying that the day of the Lord has already come. Don't let anyone deceive you in any way, for that day will not come until the rebellion occurs and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the man doomed to destruction. He will oppose and will exalt himself over everything that is called God or is worshipped, so that he sets himself up in God's temple, proclaiming himself to be God. Did I miss a dismissal of young people? Or they, they, were, they left? I didn't even notice, did I? <laughs> I was too, too busy involved eating tacos. If, and I'm sure you've already covered this ground, but if you back up with me in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, remind ourselves in verse 13, it says, Paul's teaching, I don't want you to be ignorant, brothers, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Now, the, those who are more studied than I would tell us that the time between the writing of 1 Thessalonians and 2 Thessalonians may be as little as three weeks. That Paul had been with them. He had shared with them from his own heart and from his own personal knowledge what the Lord had taught him about the second coming, about Jesus coming back for his own and gathering his own to himself. And he told them about the day of the Lord, which which we tend to summarize as that expansive time after a rapture takes place when, when tribulation occurs and then maybe on into the millennium. That period of time is often referred to as the day of the Lord. And he told them the day of the Lord won't come until this great falling away occurs, until tribulation begins and hardship happens 
And and the Thessalonians, when he wrote to them uh, just briefly after writing the first letter, in when he started in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, in verse 3, he says, We're bound to thank God always for you, brothers, as it's fitting, because your faith grows exceedingly, and the love of every one of all of you abounds towards each other. So that we ourselves boast of you among the churches of God for your patience and faith in all your persecutions and tribulations that you endure. They were in terrible suffering for their faith. They were experiencing tribulation. And because of that, and in the midst of that, somebody had given to them either a letter or maybe even what we would call a prophetic utterance in the church or Somebody had spoken to them and said, it's already come. Jesus is, the day of the Lord is here. Tribulation is upon us. That's why we're experiencing this difficulty we're in now. And it began to shake them in their structure. And if we, if we could feel with them that in the midst of their day-to-day life, all they had was tribulation and persecution and the teaching from Paul that if tribulation and persecution at this level was upon us, then Jesus must have already come and took everybody else out. And we're stuck. We're left here. And they were being shaken in their faith. So Paul lovingly writes to them again, quickly, to correct the problem. Salud. That's what they say in Mexico. So it means health. I don't know how you say gesundheit in Spanish. When Paul was writing to them, and he says, concerning the coming of the Lord Jesus and our gathering together unto him, we put a lot into these words when we study them. When we read it, Paul's writing a letter, but he's choosing his words under the anointing of the Holy Spirit, Right? The word of God is inspired. It's God breathed, he says in Timothy. This isn't just something he thought to say, but something he was inspired to write. And so he says to them, I want to remind you about our being gathered together unto him, which means if he had come, you would be with him. He said it just clearly. If he had come, he would have gathered us to himself and you would be with him now Don't be afraid that you're still here. He says, don't be shaken. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time trying to break out Greek words. I'm not that much of a scholar myself. I just read them, learn how to pronounce them, and then try to look impressive in public. (laughs) But I do know that when he says, don't be shaken in mind, the picture is the same as that ship being tossed by the sea and being feeling as though everything underneath is not solid. How many of you have ever been on a ship, a a, larger one, maybe maybe even a smaller 25, 35 foot boat? And we were on one uh, not long ago and trying to get out of the harbor and the waves and the swells were up and down and you know the all you see is the front of the sailboat and then all you see is water (laughs) one of those kind of trips and uh, i'm not experienced at this and i'm just hanging on and the captain of the ship the motor quits as we're motoring out of the harbor and we're not even in the ocean really we're about a mile out and and the engine quits well we're at the mercy of the water right and so he turns around he grabs me he puts my hand on the wheel And he says, I'm going below to see if I can figure out what's wrong with the engine. And I'm thinking, you're leaving me in charge? (laughs) Up here with that? It's coming. I thought, what do I do? He said, just make it go straight. (laughs) You know, the water throws you this way and then throws you that way. Paul the Apostle saying, don't be tossed around. Don't be soon shaken. One, in your mind. Specific. Don't be shaken in mind. Don't think the, don't let the things you've been taught get knocked out of your head. Keep your head on your shoulders if you can think of it that way. And you remember in Ephesians 4 when he said that he left apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers for the building up, the equipping of the saints in 4.12 of Ephesians. 
He said, and this is the reason he left those gift ministries in the church, of which one Paul is an apostle. And so he's ministering according to how the God gifted him to the church. He's saying, don't be shaken in mind. Don't let your thoughts be scrambled. He said, I'm here as an apostle to bring the equipping to the saints that puts you in a steadfast way until, so that we would no longer, verse 14 of Ephesians 4 says, no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine. And it's the same picture of that ship being tossed and shaken. And the next word, again, writing in his own language to them so they would catch it maybe more quickly than us, don't be soon shaken in mind or troubled. This word troubled in the original language isn't dealing with the brain. It's dealing with the emotions. So he's covering both things. Don't let your mind get shaken. Don't let your thoughts be, don't let your doctrinal understanding of the teachings you've already received be erased from your thinking and don't become overly emotional. Why wouldn't we want to do that? Joy is a great emotion. Elation. But if you're troubled, your emotions can get you into trouble, right? Can get you into an unstable place. So he says, don't let it happen. Don't let any of these three things take you out. The first one, by spirit. Some prophetic utterance that comes or some new revelation that comes from outside or somewhere else from a source that you're, in, that you're not sure of. You know, we're supposed to have, I, I like Ecclesiastes chapter 12 where it says that the teachings of the, of the preacher came by one shepherd. And I, this, is, this is where I try and gain points in the message by reinforcing your pastor. So in case he listens to the message, you know, he knows I talked well of him. You have a great pastor. You have a great pastor. I, I love your pastor. I've said that more than once. He's, he's a great guy to hang around with and he's got, he's got wisdom. He has dedication. He he's applies himself. He has a vision for the kingdom of God to come in Crestline and all around the world. And I mean, this is somebody you could trust and follow. This is somebody that if, you, if he said something that you thought was off, you can go to him and talk with him about it. You can sit down and pray together and ask God to bring the truth and revelation into the moment. You don't have to just get up and leave, right? Did I tell you about the Eusta family in Big Bear? Anybody remember? No? Oh, I'll just be real brief then. In Big Bear, we have a family. It's huge. It's called the Eusta family. It's all the people that used to go to church. <laughs> you probably have the same family that lives here, some relatives maybe. You know, you meet them on the street, so I used to go to that church. <laughs> I used to go to that. It's kind of like the story of the plane was flying over that island. You, maybe you heard this. And he looked down. I mean, there was supposed to be anybody on this little island, but he sees smoke coming up. So he finds a way to land his plane. He runs over toward the smoke, and here's these three buildings. Smoke's coming out of one of them. And the guy comes running out. He says, finally, I'm safe. Somebody finally found me. He said, well, we could get you off the island, but are you here by yourself? He says, yeah, I've been here for years all by myself. I was abandoned, stranded here. He says, it's so good. I'm finally going to get off the island. I said, well, before we leave... Can you tell me why there are these three buildings if you're here by yourself? He goes, oh yeah, the one with the smoke, that's my house. I built that to live in. What's that one? He goes, that's my church. Oh, what's that one? He goes, that's a church I used to go to. <laughs> People are kind of fickle, aren't we? But you have an excellent pastor. Maybe he's not the best in the whole world, but evidently God thinks he's the best one for right here, right now. So when other things come, whether it comes from your community or we have so much access now via internet, I mean, I can, I can reach out right now. I could right, make a search on my phone and come up with bad doctrine right here. Yep. Amen? I could come up with strange teachings right here in my pocket. So it's readily available to us to be put off, to be shaken in mind, to be troubled in our emotions because we heard something. 
or because somebody brought a new teaching. Paul says, some spirit, some spiritual thing comes your way, test, test it. Don't let it change the way you think. And, and don't be shaken by word. Some oral expression, some, somebody takes the podium and, like me this morning and brings a teaching and, and it leaves you wondering, is that true? Don't let it take you out. Verify it, right? Paul said about the, the Bereans, you know. He said, when I talked to the Bereans, he said, they always went to the word. They went to the Bible to verify what I was saying was true. He said, they were more noble. We need to be among the noble. The, those that raise the, the, the bar and say, we're gonna be more noble. We're gonna prove what we hear to be true. We're going to line it up with the rest of the word of God. And if some word comes or some teaching comes, um, I've heard it said this way, you know, because not everybody teaches everything exactly right. But it's kind of like eating chicken. You know, when you eat chicken, you come to a bone, man, you throw the bone out. You don't eat it. You just, but why quit eating chicken? Does this make sense? There's going to be some bones in there. And when you find the bones, if you're in a congregation where other people are doing the same thing, you talk about it among yourselves. You pray about it together. You, you take that bone out and you examine it and say, now this is just not true. So out it goes. Don't be shaken by some word that comes. And he said, especially don't be shaken by some letter that has come to the church in this case, when the New Testament was evolving. My understanding is that First and Second Thessalonians, maybe Galatians, are the earliest books of the Bible. So this was not common yet, that writings were going to the churches and they were sharing the reading and verifying the traditions that the apostles had left with them. So he said, if another letter comes by, especially if they've said it's from me, don't be shaken by that. And if you look with me, this is, I find this interesting. The Bible's an interesting book. Don't you think? When Paul wrote 1 Corinthians 16, as he was coming to the end of it in his, his sign-off, in verse 19 of 1 Corinthians 16, he says, The churches of Asia greet you. Aquila and Priscilla greet you heartily in the Lord within the church that is in their house. All the brethren greet you. Greet one another with a holy kiss. The salutation with my own hand, Paul's. If you look at Colossians, you see a similar thing. Sometimes we read by these pretty quickly and we don't catch it. In verse 18, the very last verse of Colossians, chapter 4, 18, this salutation by my own hand, Paul. Paul was assuring them, I always sign my own letters. It always looks like this. We still have the same practice, don't we, when we send letters to people. Even if we have them dictated or transcribed or, in my case, maybe translated into another language, we always want to get that original back and we sign it so the receiver knows that's us. That's our imprint. This is not an imposter. Don't be shaken by a letter that looks like it came from us. Verify it. There will be a falling away. There's one in every generation. There are those today that are living out what Paul told us in, when he wrote to Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter, uh, let's see, where would that be? It's in the Bible. I know it's here somewhere. Chapter 4, the Spirit speaks expressly that in the latter times some will depart from the faith. Do you believe we're living in the latter times? It feels like it, doesn't it? And I, I appreciated Pastor Bill's message when he said, how can we know when Jesus is coming? And he made the illustration right here. I think he was actually right over here when I watched him online. He was saying, how do we know when the sun's coming up? Were you here for that? Might have been back in March. He said, it's not because we look at our clock and we know it's time for it to come up. It's because if we're awake, we see it getting lighter and lighter and lighter, and we say, just any moment now, it's going to break over the trees, and there will be the sunshine. This is how it's going to be when Jesus comes again. We're going to have signs. We're going to have wonders. There's going to be a falling away, a great lawless moment. Lots of 
those who will chase after doctrines that itch their ears rather than looking for truth. They're going to be looking for things that will please them rather than please God. So they're going to be departing from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their own conscience seared with a hot iron. And then there's some lists of things that they're going to be teaching. Second Peter, if you want to go with me there, chapter 3. says, Beloved, I now write to you this second epistle in both of which I stir up your pure minds by way of reminder, that you be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets and of the commandment of us, the apostles, of the, of the Lord and Savior, knowing this first, that scoffers will come in the last days, walking according to their own lust, saying, where's the promise of his coming? For since the fathers sell, fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. Have, has anybody ever said this to you? Have you ever heard this comment? Like, well, the Bible says Jesus is coming in, but it looks like he's never going to come. Come on, everything's just like it's always been. He's not really <laughs> coming back. Might I say, they're in for a surprise. For this they willing, willfully forget that by the word of God the heavens were of old, the earth standing out of water and in the water by which the world that then existed perished, being flooded with water. But the heavens and the earth which are now preserved by the same word are reserved for fire until the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. There's a preserving going on right now, waiting. We'll come to that next week, I think. But there's something that's holding things back from going terribly wrong. But beloved, don't forget this one thing, that with the Lord, one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. I have a note in my Bible. That means that one hour is equal to about 41.66 years. That's just a free one for you. I learned that at a funeral. When a brother of mine passed away and left his family behind, and at the funeral, the man said, Jerry was driving along one moment, and the next moment he was dead. And he, when he showed up in heaven, he said, Lord, where's my family? And he said, oh, don't worry. They'll be here in about 45 minutes. And I thought, what is he telling me? Well, if a day is like a thousand years, a thousand years is like one day, my wife and kids will be along in about 40 years. Jerry, don't worry. Let's just waltz over heaven together. The Lord isn't slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord, when it comes, will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness? looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God because of which the heavens will be dissolved, dissolved, being on fire, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Hang on, we're almost to the end. Therefore, beloved, looking forward to these things, be diligent to be found by him in peace without spot and blameless, and consider that the long-suffering of our Lord is salvation, as also our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given to him, has written to you. As also in all his epistles, speaking in, the, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to understand, which untaught and unstable people twist to their own destruction, as they do also the rest of scriptures. You, therefore, this is where I'm going to try and hit the neck pitch. Okay, Ready? You, therefore, beloved, since you know this beforehand, why would we talk about the second coming of the Lord? Why do we need to know about the day of the Lord, which for us, who just a while ago said, I believe in a rapture, for us in timing, that means the church is raptured out and then starts the day of the Lord, which is tribulation and trouble. Why do I need to study that period? I'm not going to be here. I'm not being facetious. I'm just saying, think with me for a moment. We Sometimes we get caught up in trying to figure it all out 
know the exact timing. In fact, I wrote this note. Warren Wiersbe, if you know, know that gentleman, he wrote this statement. I wanted to put it in here for myself. It says, the purpose of Bible prophecy is not for us to make a calendar, but to build character. I like that statement. This is for me to try and figure out every day that everything's going to happen and when this is that and the next. That's just my view. I'm, I'm not caught up in all of that. I understand some of it, but I'm not trying to figure it all out. What I want to do is make sure I've got my hand in the hand of Jesus. And when he moves, I move with him. If he comes, I'm going. It's not going to be any surprise. When it gets brighter and brighter, I'm knowing, and, and I know he's on his way, I'm just going to draw closer and closer all the time. But he says, Beloved, since you know these things beforehand, that it will come, Jesus is coming again, there will be a period of difficulty. Beware lest you also fall from your own steadfastness, being led away with the error of the wicked. Don't get off task. Stay in here. Now, you know me. If you've been here before, you know that I'm going to enforce this. I can't do this on my own. I don't do by myself very well at all. Maybe you're like that. I need somebody alongside. I need a group that holds accountability. I need people who are thinking thoughts out of the Bible to think thoughts with me so that when mine are crooked, they straighten me out. I don't get it all by myself. This is a big book. There's a lot to know. But when I get to know Jesus and I get to know him by being in a community of people who are his body, I feel safe. I feel like I'm in a place where I'm okay. And if something changes, if I don't catch it, somebody else will. The leadership will show. The leadership say, we're, oh, we're turning left. I say, okay, I didn't catch that, but I'm turning left. Let's go. How do you find the will of God for your own life? by being a part of a larger group that's discovering the will of God together. Our task, I believe, when we talk about the end times and the second coming of Jesus, is, is this next sentence in 2 Peter. In verse 18 it says, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be the glory both now and forever. Amen. My task, your task, is to grow in the grace of Jesus. What is grace? Well, I'm, I bet if we asked for definitions, we'd get a few. And they'd probably all be right. I mean, it's just different views of the same definition. But grace, some would say it's the unmerited favor of God. True. Grace, it's what I don't deserve. True. Judgment, it's what I'm not going to get. Because of the grace of God, my judgment's already put on the cross on Jesus. He took my judgment. I'm never going to be judged for the things I've been forgiven for because he took them to the cross. That's grace. Not getting what you actually deserve. Grace, the empowering presence of God that makes you able to accomplish what he's called you to do because you can't do it by yourself. Grace, the enabling power of God resident within me because he said he would dwell in me with the Holy Spirit. I'm supposed to grow in that grace. It's a deposit, yes, but I need to flex. I need to learn how to apply it. I need to learn how to extend grace to others. I need to become godlike in living in grace. I also need to know, as we talked earlier, brother, we need to know that we can't take that grace and put it over the top of us, the Bible says, like a cloak in the King James of lasciviousness, which is why we don't use the King James much anymore, because okay. nobody can say lasciviousness. We don't use it as a cloak to put over our evil works and say, look how good I am on the outside, but inside we're rotten. That's called abusing grace. We want to be grace users not grace abusers. We want to live by his grace. We want to say, it's okay to come home. It's okay to be received in the kingdom. It's okay to be forgiven, but I'm not going to live like I shouldn't because now I'm motivated by his love. I'm motivated by relationship with him and I want to learn to grow in grace. I want to learn to depend on him every breath. Every breath. 
But it says we're also supposed to grow in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus. And those of you who've taken time to look into some of the Greek stuff that, that I pretend to know, this is the word gnosis. It doesn't mean knowledge just in my head. It would mean like, you know, Bobby and I just met this morning, and Aaron and I just met this morning. Already I can tell it would be fun to hang out with these guys. <laughs> I mean, I don't know them, but it's like, yeah, if they'd let me, the old guy, if you want the old guy hanging out, not really, it's okay, let's ditch him. But, <laughs> but I prayed with them, I talked with them, we drank a little coffee kind of next to each other, and I thought, just a witness that we're in this together. We're, we're family, actually. So you're stuck with me, actually. But, <laughs> but we're family. And if I wanted to grow in the knowledge of them, how would I accomplish that? I'm just trying to stimulate our thinking. I might want to eat lunch with them today. I might want to spend a little more time with them. I might call every now and then or text them out at the camp or wherever they're at and, or behind your guitar if that's where you're hiding and, and, and just say, what are you thinking? How do you see this? And I would grow in my intimate relational knowledge of who they are. I mean, if you gave me a half a day with these guys, I could tell you their birthdays, I could tell you their history, I could tell you their family, their family names, their family birthdays. I would drag it out of them. And I, and I would write it all down, and then I would say to myself, I know them better. My knowledge would be expanded, but if I spend time with them, our relationship will expand, right? And I'm not saying anything too difficult, right? That's gnosis. We're supposed to grow in the grace and the knowledge of the Lord Jesus. We're supposed to know him better every day. How am I going to know Jesus better every day? By spending time with him. Now, the difficult part is, well, how will I spend time with him? That's a challenge in our busy culture. I was speaking with another young man last night. I asked, I said, so tell me, what does your devotional life look like? We use those words in Christendom. What's devotional life? Well, that's when I spend quiet time with God. We call that devotions, right? I mean, it's an experience of being devoted to him. How, what does your devotional life look like? And his answer was, well, it's not like it should be. I'm going to attempt this right here. You probably have said something like that. It's not like it should be. Or if I asked, how many of you pray enough? Well, that's a good one. Nobody, nobody ever goes, I pray enough. No one. I had talked to a guy once who prayed six hours a day, and he says, you know, I just don't pray enough. So evidently, none of us pray enough. I said, what's your devotional life look like? And he says, not like it should be. I said, stop right there. What in your mind should it be? In other words, what law have you written for yourself that you've now brought yourself under to try and fulfill the law? He said, well, it should be every day and it should be this much time. I said, could I stop you again? You know, as long as you keep writing new laws to substitute the Ten Commandments or the other 365 laws of Judaism that bring you under performance-based Christianity, we call it Judaism light. Uh -huh. As long as you keep writing new laws to replace the old ones that Jesus took care of, you're always going to live in a condemned fashion because you cannot keep the law and win. He said, what am I supposed to do? I said, how about if you say something like, I love spending time with Jesus and he's alive and he wants to spend time with me and wouldn't that be exciting if, if every day you elbowed anything you could out of the way to spend time with him? He goes, yeah, that's how it should be. I said, well, then let's do that. Let's not make it legalistic. Like, I've, you know, it's, oh, it's 901. I'm a minute late. Quick, I better read this part of the Bible. And Jesus, I'm going to pray a little bit. And, and then say, whew, okay, whew, 959, I did it in an hour. And I can go to work and I fulfilled the law. And, and I don't know, my mind, I'm kind of imaginative. I thank God the other day I have a good imagination. He gave it to me. But I, I see me walking off from that experience and him sort of scratching his head like, where's he going? I, we, I, didn't, I didn't even get to say anything. <sighs> this is relationship. 
No wonder you're having problems in your marriage, buddy. Huh? It, it flows over to the rest of life. Grow in the grace and the knowledge that intimate relationship with Jesus where you know him better. You, you know how he moves. You know, you know when he speaks. You, you feel his presence. Not just an emotional level, but that's okay too. But you know when it's him. And you know when it's not him. That's how you avoid error. Is by knowing him intimately. And when somebody else says, tell me about Jesus it's not hard. You don't say, well, let me show you these 15 scriptures right away and try and teach you some doctrine. You say, well, let me tell you about my Jesus. When I wake up in the morning, it's like he's right there waiting to talk to me. <laughs> it scares me sometimes. You know, you open my eyes and the psalmist said, when I awake, you're still with me. He never leaves. He's omnipotent. He's all powerful. He's all knowing and he's all loving. He constantly helps me. He guides my day. He speaks to me, and I can actually hear him. He's my friend. Would you like to meet my best friend? They're going, yeah, I'd like to meet that Jesus. I'm not looking for the one that says, thou shalt not, thou shalt not, thou shalt not, thou shalt not. I'm looking for the one that says, come have a life eternal. Come have it to the full. Live in abundance of blessing by living close to me. Be strong in grace, Paul said to Timothy. 2 Timothy chapter 2. He said, be strong in the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. Remember when Paul said when he was having such difficulty in his life, he said, in my, in my weaknesses, he said that he would be strong in me, that his grace was sufficient for me. And so Paul turned his thoughts around. He says, now I glory. I take glory in my weakness because in my weakness, I'm made strong. By his grace. I know it's not me that does it, it's him. I know I can't claw my way back to the cross when I've fallen, when I've strayed, when I've failed. I can't do enough penance. I can't be sad enough or cry enough to get right with God. He extends his grace to me and says, Come. I receive you. I love you. I've been right here waiting for you the whole time. You've been a little foolish, <laughs> no doubt. We're going to work through that. But first, I need you to know I love you beyond all measure. And there's no sin that can take you far away from me, far enough away from me that I can't reach you. That's Jesus to me. In Ephesians 4.15, where he said, don't be that the body, the leadership of the body was given to us to equip us, to keep us from being tossed. He said that you and I are supposed to be speaking the truth in love. And when we do, we grow up into the head, which is Jesus. This was part of the message to the Thessalonians. And you'll find it as you go through Second Thessalonians with pastor. Is that some of them thought the second coming was either so close or had already come the ones who thought it was so close quit their jobs and just sat out and said, "He's why work? Well, I don't need to stock up my checking account. He's coming. I don't need to pay my house payment. This is great. I don't have to pay American Express or anybody else because Jesus is coming and going to snatch me out of this. And Paul later says, hey, those who aren't working, what? Don't work, don't eat. Get back to work. He's coming, but we don't know when. But because he's coming, what are we supposed to do? Grow in the grace of the Lord Jesus and become more intimately knowledgeable of him. There is an apostasy coming. There is a falling away. It's happening around us all the time. There's lots of false teaching. There's lots of error that's being transmitted all around the world. You don't have to go far to find it. You know, you can, you can if you want, just, you know, Google up... Uh, second coming of Jesus and pull up a few YouTubes and you're going to find some weirdos in a hurry. I mean, it's bizarre. But if you don't know the word, you can be caught off guard. And if you don't have people around you to help keep you balanced, you can be led astray and deceived. It's like the, the old guy that was tired of paying the high price of, of, uh, for the feed that he was feeding his mule. And he thought, well, you know, I'm just tired of paying so much, so I'm going to mix a little sawdust in with it. 
Make it stretch a little more. Kind of like all you guys that are eating store-bought cereal, you know what? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> so I put a little sawdust in there, and, and it didn't seem to affect the mule too much. You know, you're still doing all right, but, you know, it wasn't long, and the mule died. Right? Because a mule can't live on sawdust, and nor can you. But that's how the enemy will start feeding you a little of this and a little of that, especially if you're wandering around on your own. So I just want to exhort you, stay connected. If you don't think we're a long ways off from where we started, I, this is just a note that I, I write a lot of these notes for myself, and then every now and then I think I should share them. But did you know that 88 of the first 100 colleges established in, the, in America, 88 of the first 100, were organized to promote, promote the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ? You say, well, how far? How far are we from there now? Hmm? The young man I was talking to last night said he, in the environment he's in, there are people that come from all over the world, and most of them are non-Christians. And he was, we were talking about how to share light, the life of Jesus in that environment. He said, I had one girl come recently who said she was a Christian, and I got really excited about having fellowship in the environment we're in where we work. And as I began to talk to her, she said, I just graduated from college. And now she was questioning everything about faith. And they had just taught it right out of her. They had made her question. It's sort of like God's not dead. And I know you guys participated in seeing that. It's that kind of an environment in the educational system that's stripping faith rather than building it up again. So all these things are signs. All these things are indications that it's closer. Certainly today we're closer to Jesus' coming than yesterday. But what are we going to do about it? Let's draw close to him. He said if we would draw close to him, he would draw close to us. If we would pursue him, he would be right there. As my brother here and I were talking before church, it doesn't matter how many steps we've taken away from God, if we have, that when we turn around to come home, it's only one step back because he's been following us the whole time. Or as Pastor Rob, by our pastor in Big Bear said in Mexico as he was preaching, he said, the distance back to God is never any further than the distance between your knees and the floor. I thought, amen, that's a short distance. I just need to humble myself again and say, Lord, can I come home? You're in. Grace pours out and his love draws you back in. He will correct. He will train. He will work on disciplining us. Amen. He's an excellent father. He knows what to do with us when we yield to him. Let me pray. Father, this morning I'm grateful that you care about us. Jesus, I thank you that you said while you were in the world, you kept all of those that the Father had given you. You didn't lose one except for the son of perdition that scripture might be fulfilled. And Lord, I'm just reminded that you will never lose me. You will never lose us. We place ourselves in your hand this morning, Jesus, and we pray that you will cover us, as the psalmist said, under the shadow of your wing, that you would be our preserving and our protecting, that you will allow us to get closer and closer to you every day so that when difficult times arrive, when apostasy is around us, we'll recognize it for what it is. Holy Spirit, I pray that you will take us and teach us as the word says you would, that you would lead us and guide us into all truth so that we can see the error when it shows up. That you will help us to hide your word in our heart that we might not sin against you and that we would also have that two-edged sword ready and waiting for the defense of the gospel when it's necessary. We ask for your help in these things in the name of Jesus, and we believe that you will answer. Amen. Amen. So closing up, I would say, you know, the question isn't so much when will Jesus return as much as it might be when will you go to meet him? And are you ready for that? How many of you are ready to meet Jesus if it's today? You know, if we left here and and we didn't make it home, would we be ready to go?
would be like my friend Jerry who was driving down the freeway one moment and then was dead in the next instant from an accident. That was where'd the steering wheel go? <laughs> to be absent from the bodies, to be present with the Lord, are we ready to go? How about you, Bob? You ready to go? Good. Let's go together. Amen. Come on. I think you guys are up next, right? Amen. Close this out. It's been good to be with you. And as we're parting company, like John the Apostle said, do your best, love one another. You know? <coughs> Hug a few people. <laughs> Shake a few hands. And uh, love one another. And I would just want to encourage us too, if there's anyone here that I've not, if I've not met you and I don't know you and you have never allowed Jesus to become your Savior, then when he comes, the Bible says you won't go with him. But we could take care of that today. Amen. It's real simple. You just call on his name. And I would love to pray with you and lead you into that moment. So I'll just stick around right around here. And if you want to pray and ask Christ to make sure you're ready, or if you're a believer and you're just trying to make your way back, let's pray together. And we'll just agree with you that God will receive you back to himself and get you on the path of life. Amen? Yes. Amen. God bless you. I don't know if there's anything else we need to do. Thank you, Pastor Jeff. You're welcome. I'll tell my boss you said that. <laughs> Amen. Because he deserves the glory. Amen? Yes. Amen. God bless you. Have a great afternoon. Take your sunscreen. <laughs>